All right, good morning. Last conference day, last parallels, last presentation. So thank you for still being present. I'll try to be extra entertaining. Um, so my presentation is about social protection floor gaps and pandemic relief, a case for universalism. Um, I decided to not go very much into the details of the paper, but more present sort of the debate that it links to more broadly, um, talk a little bit about the findings and the data that I've been working with. Um, so I will start at the reverse order. Um, what did I find? That uh, universal policies are more prominent when social protection gaps exist. Um, with social protection floor gaps, I mean um, a specific measure that looks at the implementation of, of social protection floors in line with the ILO Social Protection Floor Recommendation 202 that has been ratified in 2012 by, I think, all of the uh, 187 member states. And where there are sort of financing gaps um, in terms of achieving those social protection floors, you could see more universal um, approaches in the way that countries responded to the crisis. There are then, of course, also variations across high-income countries and the rest of the world. What I mean there is like any country that is classified as non-high-income. Um, overall, uh, globally, using the database that I've been working with, you can see that the targeted responses are more dominant. I think for anyone who worked in social protection, that's not surprising. Um, but the share of universal policies in crisis relief in lower um, uh, it's lower in uh, high-income countries, right? They, these countries are also those that have lower financing gaps. Um, so the debate that it links to, I, I think, is like something that Yuka also alluded to in a way. Um, it's the targeted versus universal debate. I think it has been around for a couple of decades. And of course, there are like benefits um, to both, but also costs, I would say. Um, I'm trying to summarize a few of those here. Um, so when it comes to targeted, like of course, we have an element of selectivity in that we kind of try and isolate the groups or like identify the groups that are most in need. It depends on sort of like the political foundation that is underpinning the, the, the way countries formulate their programs. It is also the dominant method, as I mentioned, and also, it was also the dominant method in crisis relief. And it's been argued also that it's fiscally more feasible, right? If you think about, okay, we have a, um, a like pot of public funds, we want to give it to those most in need, so it can be a bit more efficient than having broad-based welfare. That's also the counter-argument towards more universal um, methods that are in a broad sense, available to all. As Yuka mentioned, the most, let's say, radical example of that is the universal basic income um, or the universal provision of basic services. It can go on either, from either direction. It seems to be a bit more contested and it hasn't really been implemented. It has been piloted in different spaces with different results. Uh, shortcomings of the targeted, I think everyone is uh, familiar with that in the terms of inclusion and exclusion errors. Um, also, sometimes in terms of political support, um, I don't know how, in how far um, you're familiar with the literature that's more like from the element, like the perspective of social psychology and economics where... Sometimes, I mean, in terms of from a voter perspective, you're more likely to support programs where you stand to benefit yourself. In terms of targeting, there's also um, social costs and certain stigma that um, colleagues of mine, former colleagues of mine at IDS have been working on. Um, for the universal one, you could argue you have lower uh, targeting costs, but um, I would say from what I've seen in recent studies, the way that it is assessed whether they are politically supported as a more broader understanding of fairness and how inequalities are justified or reasoned about in a, um, in a country's context. And there are also first studies that look at whether it can be a tool for creating greater social cohesion. However, there are still a bit of mixed results, I would say. Uh, very interesting if you're looking at that in the um, post-crisis area as well. So uh, why, why does this debate still matter or matters in um, 
terms of looking at uh, crisis relief, um, as has been mentioned many times, I think, and particularly in this panel, there was a very rapid expansion of social protection um, as a consequence of the pandemic. And there's also been that um, debate sort of that sparked in sort of looking at social protection sort of at the critical moment um, or seeing it a little bit at a crossroad, uh, I would say. Um, certainly a moment for institutional learning to revisit some of the infrastructure that is in place, where are the gaps and what are the best ways forwards. I'm also talking about debates on creating adaptive systems. Um, I think it's very much what uh, the first presentation was trying to show also in terms of you have shifts in beneficiaries during the crisis but also shifting needs at different times and often at a very ad hoc or unpredictable uh, manner. So how can you adequately reflect that in the system to scale up or expand it um, accordingly? So I think the broader question that I would like to bring to the audience, um, rather than giving a, a definite answer, um, I think it's an ongoing dialogue, is whether we should kind of walk towards ever more fine-tuned systems, learning, for example, from climate change, having early warning indicators and so forth, or whether we should go rather like in a different direction of saying, possibly we'll never get it exactly right that we are able in these kind of very rapidly unfolding events that we always find those that are most in need and what their needs are, should we just have a broad-based um, kind of landscape of social protection provision in place, right? Um, so, a little bit about the data that I've been working with, and there are certainly different databases that you can use, um, housed by different institutions. So, the ones that I used was the COVID stimulus tracker, which um, has been published by, I'm just going to pronounce it as it's written, UNESCO, which is a, an acronym. <laughs> So as you can see on the, on the left side, it's, I think it's a nice illustration that they capture a lot of countries and that you can see that it was truly a global response because all the blue areas had um, more than 10 policy measures, um, the green areas less than 10 and the red areas still less than five, but nevertheless some policy measures, right? And the other, the pie chart that I'm including is just to highlight that it has also information on the specific beneficiaries. So this is on a bit more high level basis. There's also variables that have it in more detail, as I will show you here. So in order to classify these, all these policies that are captured in this database into universal versus targeted responses, it's a little bit of an arbitrary exercise, I would say. Um, in part also because there is a lot of policy innovation and I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later on. So I don't think this table there is very uh, readable for you, but I nevertheless include it to show you have the first column which are um, policy measures that classify as universal in line with the definition that they reach every citizen based on a, a basic criterion. I think Yuka was saying that it's like sort of broadly categorical, like universal pensions, for example, that go to any citizens of a certain age group, right? And then you have the, the column after that one, which are the targeted measures, and there you have like very, some of the um, targeting that we have heard, like proxy means tested, um, uh, per people with uh, disabilities, as was also in Miguel's um, presentation, but then there were also um, indigenous people, there were people who were formerly in prison or are in prison, so also perhaps a new way of setting up um, beneficiaries in this, in this space of crisis relief, right? And it, there's a question, of course, of what we take forward from this. Um, so overall, also you can see that targeted uh, dominates, as I have uh, mentioned before. So this uh, data I bring together with the social protection floor index. So um, unless, uh, unlike that Miguel presented, which was more about coverage, this can be more understood as a financing gap. Um, for anyone who has, uh, who's not familiar with the recommendation, it basically sets out uh, three basic income guarantees for children, people on active age and older persons. 
and access to uh, universal health, uh, like basic health coverage, right? So what um, I've been part of uh, kind of designing this uh, index, uh, I think almost like eight years ago now, Jesus. <laughs> and um, what we do is like we look at basically an income gap and a health gap. So I'm not going too much into the technical details, but if you would like to hear more about it, please ask any questions. Um, the, the important thing is to understand what this measure basically expresses is like how much of a country's GDP would be needed in order to establish social protection flows in the, in the country. Um, with the recent edition, they also um, publish it as a percentage of total government revenue, which I think will be very interesting for um, the audience of this conference. Uh, I also use, for the income gaps, I use um, a relative poverty line, obviously, to make it applicable across the global north and the global south, rather than absolute poverty lines, right? So to, to come back to the findings that I showed you in the beginning, um, so what, as I said before, um, so if a country has, if the financing gap was, uh, increases across countries, you have more universal responses in the crisis relief. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because say your, your system is not as uh, expansive in terms of coverage and you need to quickly respond to people's needs, it's easier to kind of uh, implement a broader category and perhaps work, or rather have inclusion errors than exclusion errors during these times. Um, what I also wondered, and I think that's something that can be explored uh, going forward, whether this is an uh, ad hoc or sort of once-off design shift that was um, found in, in particular in non-high income countries, or whether there is a sort of institutional momentum to um, yeah, go forward in a different direction in terms of like rethinking the, the particularities of targeting methods. As I highlighted before as well, there's a lot of um, new beneficiary categories and like Miguel, I also worked with two different um, definitions of social protection. So one that was perhaps a little bit more traditional, I'd say, and one that was expansive and that it also included programs that were targeted at, S at SMEs, you know, so part of social protection, active labor market programs that was targeted at employment, we can make an argument, of course, like programs that are geared towards um, businesses are also equally relevant, right? Um, so there's kind of, I would say there's even like merit of looking at sort of new and old beneficiaries and that um, crisis response and s perhaps rethink whether in, in which ways we could shift the conceptual boundaries of social protection. And then, of course, in financing uh, those crisis responses, I think there's a big question now of what to keep, um, which is a very country-specific question and not something I can answer on this very global level analysis. But what I would like to sort of um, conclude with is still a question, right? Because I've done some first-level, high-level explorations, or you can see also on that even in the like sort of econometric estimations, it's an association, it's not a causal explanation that you can have. But uh, nevertheless, I would say as far um, as the results goes, like the existing system of course uh, matters um, for the design of crisis response, I think for various reasons, if you think about vertical and horizontal expansions. Oh great, <laughs> I'll be quicker than that. Um, there's also that uh, question, and that's something that I'm working on with uh, colleagues to bring more politics into the space of social protection, because of course there's a lot of merit in exploring like sort of the technicalities of programs, but there's also a way of looking like what is the kind of, what is the social fabrics of political support in the countries, who stands to benefit, which is also relevant for like uh, the collection side, right? What in terms of fairness and taxation. And lastly, I mean, of course, um, in terms of fiscal feasibility, I'd be very interesting to hear because I'm not really working on the, on the collection side as much, right? It's like, okay, what, what is considered more, um, fiscal fee uh, feasible, knowing that targeting is a costly exercise, and if we go forward with like these adaptive systems that have, say, more elaborate early warning indicators and like trying to make targeting more fine-tuned, is that more feasible or is it more having like a broad-based measure in place, perhaps a 
like narrower version than a basic income uh, grant. Um, also, there are there differences sort of um, that we could look at in terms of cost for horizontal versus um, vertical expansions. Okay, so I, I think I will leave it at that so we have some more time to discuss. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>